Turkey, the land where the West meets the East, famous for being the center of two of the greatest empires ever, the Byzantine and Ottoman, it has been endowed with a syncretic culture that reflects its rich and diverse history. Nowhere is this more evident than in its food. So I thought, what better way to talk about Turkish history than over Turkish food? Welcome back to a new episode of Digesting History. I know it's been a long time, I'm really excited to get it back underway and uh, I'm here with a brand new guest as you can see. Uh, you want to introduce yourself my friend? Hi everyone, uh, Ibrahim Yate here and uh, I'm one of Tarek's friends and a uh, subscriber to the channel. Yeah, long time subscriber, Ibrahim's actually my first patron so uh, he's my best friend basically. <laughs> What have you ordered? So I've ordered the Paja Koba, which is a soup that's made from the meat of the neck of a lamb. Right. And like, I think it's a very traditional, uh, nomadic yeah. Turkic dish. Exactly. In, in that whole region, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, all the way to like Greece and the Balkans, they have something like this. Call it different names. Like in Afghanistan, mm. we call it Kale Pache. But um, the waiter was just telling us, that this is slightly different because it's got mm. yogurt in it, right? Yeah. But, yeah, that's very nice. And over here, what I'm eating on is just like a mixed meze, which is all the Middle Eastern starters that you can think of. Mm. So it's very nice. Let's start talking about some history, dude. Sure thing. So the first time me and Ibrahim, because me and Ibrahim have known each other for almost like 15 years, right? Yeah. And we actually bonded over history. It was uh, yeah. Age of Empires, right? Age of Empires, we did GCSE, A-level history, yeah. both did it for our degrees. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Turkish history. Sure. Why don't you start us off? What do you know about Turkish history? What don't you know about it? What, what excites you about it? Give me a starting point. Um, yeah, so I know, uh, you know, Turks originally were from uh, Central Asia. They were nomadic. Uh, they gradually moved downwards into the, um, the Persian plateau and they interacted with Persians, Arabs, Greeks, uh, everyone in the region and slowly over time they became more powerful and um, yeah, they established the modern day uh, nation of Turkey in Anatolia or Asia Minor and uh, yeah, so I know that I kind of know the basic timeline of Turkish history, yeah. where they are originally from. I, I guess I don't know much about what made them so successful from being nomadic tribes to uh, developing, you know, the big Ottoman Empire. Nice. Okay. Okay. So I don't know about that. Okay. Okay. So you never had this before, huh? Mm -mm. So my first time having both um, the uh, soup and uh, this new dish that's just come. Okay. So this is. Um, Chorban uh, Kavuma, and it's uh, like a like a lamb dish with rice and then peppers on the side. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And what, what do you have? I got the lamb beti, which I'm such a big fan of. Um, most, not more so than anything. One reason I am mm. is because of how elaborate it is. Yeah, it's very uh, decorative. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I, I really respect that when people go to a lot of hard work to make mm. food look presentable. I know. Um, you gotta you never buy this bad boy. No, this does not disappoint. No? Very good. Tremendous. Tremendous. Very, very good. Let's get back to the history. Sure thing. So, one of the ways that the Turks originally got introduced into the Middle East was through the Gilman system. Which I find super interesting because do you, do you know why they would do that? No, I'm think, not sure why it happened. Think about it from the perspective of the leader, right? So when you're the leader, there's a lot of like intrigue going on in the court. Mm. There's like factions, this team versus that team. Mm. So imagine you as the leader could introduce a new party 
a third party which is loyal to nobody but you that would sound like a dream right but when, when you say slaves that would mean they just don't get paid at all no 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 is that no. sustainable like what does that mean that's a great question so the part of the problem with using the word slave in the english language is you already have like preconceived notions which you connect it to like slavery in the american south mm. with cotton and uh, the transit. absolutely no rights exactly Dehumanized. exactly no, no. these people were not like i'm not trying to make it out to be like they, they were like it's a good thing or anything because <clears throat> they do get moved away from their, their, their where they were born where they were raised and everything but the level of opportunities that they get, that they were given in life, mm. you can't even compare them. Like yeah. these, like there's whole dynasties born out out of the system. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got the Mamluk uh, slave dynasty in Delhi. Oh, yeah, there's another question I had. So, Mamluk mm. is a phrase that I associated with Berber soldiers. Okay. But I've always heard it. Um, but I've heard it recently being used for Turks and now just for in Delhi and India. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder where did that phrase come from? I thought Mamluk was Berber, African. I no, no, no. Oh, and the, uh, the reason you're probably thinking that is because there was a Mamluk dynasty in Egypt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they weren't exactly. Berbers. They were actually Turks. Oh, I didn't. Okay, yeah. another thing. Yeah, I didn't realize. They, so, the Mamluk dynasty of uh, Egypt is divided into two. Mm. The first one I want to say was um, Turkic and the second one was like Circassian. What's Circassian? Circassian is this beautiful ethnicity in the Caucasus. Mm. They're literally famous in the early modern period in Europe mm. for having beauty, like aesthetic beauty. Like there was a saying like, oh that lady is of Circassian beauty. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and they're really good wrestlers uh, to, like today. Yeah. Like in the Olympics, when you watch like freestyle wrestling, I don't know how good they are in Greco, but freestyle wrestling is like dominated by those guys. Mm. Mountainous warrior people, right? But no, 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 the Mamluks is like connected to Hilman. Okay. So Mamluk would be like a slave soldier. Okay, understood. I don't think they're the same word, Hilman and Mamluk, mm. but they're very close to each other. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, that's how they were first introduced Turks into the Middle East, through that system. But some of these Turks, they looked around, and after like a generation of being loyal to the Khalif, they looked around and saw so much weakness mm. in the Abbasid Khalifat, that they sensed opportunity. Mm. So, what they started doing was, they started setting up their own uh, dynasties and states. Yeah. Like Ahmad ibn Tulun in uh, Egypt and Syria. And uh, other places, like even the Ghaznavids. Mm. Ghaznavid. Um, so they started asking themselves, why do I need to be in this situation when I could rule better? I could do this better. Exactly, and yeah. to be fair, it's a good way of putting it, because they, in some ways they did do a better job. Mm. So that's all like the 9th century, 10th century. So when the Seljuks invaded the, the Middle East in the 11th century, they did uh, something which the Ghaznavids had done like 50 years before them yeah. and that would become a pattern for future dynasties as well and it's one of the most important most important what? developments yeah. and it's called the Turco-Persian tradition okay. what do you think that means? now when you hear it what comes into your mind? so from my current knowledge I know that um, there's a lot of like cultural and government administration overlap between Turks and Persians. They nice. interacted a lot. Nice. They yeah. took ideas from each other. They shared ideas. And I guess the, the Turco-Persian tradition mm -hmm. just refers to the fact that more so than maybe other cultures around the time, yeah. they, they were kind of mutually dependent or they flourished off of each other. Like there's lots, there's lots of uh, similarities between them and they're deliberate, they're not just by accident. Nice, yeah. exactly. My friend Ibrahim here, he's Iranian, so he's being too humble. The relationship, <laughs> the relationship was a lot, a lot more... Is everything okay? Everything's amazing. Yeah, good. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. The relationship was a lot more one-sided 
than what he just made it out to be. What it was is that it's Turkic dynasties appropriating a Persian governmental system. It's not, there isn't so much back and forth about, no offense to the Turks, Turks teaching the Persians about like the bureaucracy and things of those nature. Yeah. Yeah? And that's not to take anything away from them or anything. It's just the Persians had developed a really good system by this point, whereby like the most Islamic uh, Islamic uh, dynasties and governments that were created would in some ways or another kind of use the model that was left behind for them by the Persians. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, Persian empires had been around for a while. So just by virtue of that fact, they had a long time to perfect these... Um, Ways of organizing society. Right? Like, this guy is so humble, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that? <laughs> you could say that. But you could also just say the Persians were incredible at, at statecraft. That's literally what it is. Because the Achaemenids themselves. Oh, so, um, yeah, there were three, r- roughly three Persian empires. Right, right. Yeah, Achaemenids, Parthian, and then Sasanian, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But the Parthians are not even considered. Iranian, so They're much. They're Kurdish, really. Mendi. Um, Mendi, I think, uh, the Medes. There was like a different, like a different Persian group from the original Achaemenids. No, no, no. The, the Medes are like the group that came before the Achaemenids. And they were, you could call them probably like Persians. Yeah. But the Parthians, they're a little bit more Turkic. Oh, really? I yeah, yeah. Know. So the Sasanians, so what it is, is it's the Achaemenid, Iskandar, Alexander, mm. then the Parthians, and then the Sasanians. Okay. So when the Sasanians came into power, mm. some people, not everybody, some people call it the the Sasanian restoration, the, the Persian restoration. Yeah, I know I know that they really didn't like the Parthians and they tried to erase all of their records from this. Yeah, yeah, so you could you could say that, that maybe because they're antagonistic to their predecessors. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you could say that. Put their stamp. Yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm not hundred percent sure because ancient history is not my uh, yeah. field of expertise. But I don't think the Parthians were Persians. I'm, I'm I feel pretty confident about it. I think they were more Turkic, Scythians. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Seljuks. So they come, they set up a, uh, a government, um, and they do something that's very important for the history of the nation of Turkey, mm. which is win a battle in uh, 1071. Mm. Do you know the name of the battle? Um, Manzika. Nice, yeah. I did a, a video on it as well. That's where I got that from. <laughs> did you? <laughs> nice. But that battle where they defeated, uh, defeated the Byzantines mm. kind of opened up Anatolia to the Turkification yeah. of that peninsula. Um, and literally within 10 years, something like 150 miles away from Constantinople, there was a city taken over mm. by the uh, Turks. So that's where <coughs> kind of Turkey may have started, like modern day Turkey. Yeah, no. I think it's fair to say that. The Byzantines had a little bit of a uh, comeback straight after that, mm. for about a hundred years. It's called the Komnenian Restoration, mm. but that opened the doors. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of, um, I think, uh, I can't remember who said it, but there's the phrase, when someone asks you what were the consequences of the Russian Revolution or the French Revolution, uh, the person, this person said, "Oh, it's too early to tell," no. even though it's like several hundred years after. That's a perfect yeah. way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For the life of me, I can't remember who said it, but it's a very famous quote. I've heard that a lot as well, yeah. but yeah, it just shows that history is like a grand game, right? You need Definitely, time yeah. for it to unveil itself. Mm. So, getting back to our story, the Seljuks—they're only around for like the the Great Seljuk Empire, only around for around thirty years. So really? More, yeah, yeah. Only 30 years. I would have assumed longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they, they still stick around, but it's not in their imperial glory like they were. Yeah. They split up, they fight among themselves, um, etc., etc. Mm. And then you get like an offshoot of them called the uh, Sultanat of Rum, mm. which is still run by the, uh, an offshoot of the Seljuks. And uh, they're, they're based in Anatolia. And they, and they have a good uh, little time in the 12th and the first half of the 13th century, but that's when the Mongols come in. Mm. So I know from like, my own 
knowledge that the Mongols were like a, a mass tidal wave, kind of just caused destruction across like thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, acres of land, multiple nations. Exactly. Uh, and even for like people as well, like a whole bunch of uh, people, uh, especially Turks, migrated westward into the Middle East to get away from the Mongols. Mm. I mean, the Mongols still caught up with them, but... <laughs> yeah. like, they're uh, fast horses. They're really fast horses, and a lot of ambition. <laughs> yeah. But Rumi was one of those people. Mm. Rumi was born in modern-day Afghanistan. Like, his name is actually Jalaluddin Balkhi, in some places. Because yeah. he was born so in Balkhi. So I was reading about Rumi recently, and it seems like he's um, a, a figure of three nations, at least. Three? Why three? Iran? Yeah, so oh. he was born in Afghanistan, yeah. he wrote in Persian, and he died in uh, Konya, in, um, in Turkey. Yeah. And all three nations have like a very special um, attachment to him in, in their culture. Yeah. yeah. But, so, after the Mongols take over, there's a disintegration of power within Anatolia, mm -hmm. where you get the formation of Beyliks. Have you heard of that before? No. Is Beyliks a person or a place? No, it's like uh, little small states. Yeah. I think, don't quote me on this, but I think it just means like princely states. Okay. Yeah. So you get those, and that's basically the course of the 14th century. But one of those Beyliks, mm. in fact, probably the smallest one, in the worst place, because it's right next to Constantinople, yeah. is the Beylik of Osman. Okay. Which is the Ottoman, uh, which is where the Ottomans come from. Mm. And they grow really quick. Yeah. Do we know why that is? What did they do that made them grow quick? There's, there's like, a lot of historians have thought about this. Mm. And there's a bunch of different reasons. One of them is the fact that the fact that they were so close to Constantinople might have actually worked to their advantage. Mm. Because, and I think this is called the, the Gaza theory. Is Gaza is like the Arabic word for uh, holy war. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think it's similar to jihad. It must be yeah. similar to jihad. Because they were so close to uh, Constantinople, they would market in 21st century uh, terms their wars against them as like a holy struggle. Mm. So if you have like Turks from the other side of Anatolia, yeah, you know, willing to die for the cause of Islam, mm. and obviously make a little bit of money as a soldier as well, obviously. Yeah. Um, they'd be willing to go there. So, yeah, the, they kind of acted like a beacon that drew more Turks in. Exactly. Yeah. And at the same time, the, uh, the, the, the Byzantines are going through a really bad time. The Fourth Crusade had just happened. Yeah. And uh, in 1261, the Byzantines recaptured Constantinople. But the, the Crusaders had just messed it up so mm. much. They just took everything from it. Oh, just goes to show, you know, the old uh, phrase, the empires don't get defeated per se, they fall from within, right. and that's when they get, they're open to attack and open to vulnerability. That's a good point, yeah, exactly. Because once once you, you're weak from the inside, yeah. it's, you just need somebody to kind of just push you over the yeah. edge, right? Exactly. But the Ottomans, so there's that, the Gaza theory, there's the weakness of their uh, uh, the Byzantines, and um, and fair play to them, like, they have really capable leaders as well. Definitely. Yeah. One of the earliest ones, the, um, wait, Usman, Orhan, and Murad. Murad, the third one, right? Mm. He's the one that started the Janissary Corps. You heard of that? Cause, whatever it's called. Yeah, so Janissaries are like very powerful Turkish soldiers who uh, eventually wielded gun gunpowder and gunfire. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he would recruit them from a system that he started, which uh, sounds a little similar. Well, no, it's it's similar in, in theory to the Ghilman system, which yeah. is the Dev Shirme. Have you heard of that before? No, I have not. Because basically they just go around to like different um, villages in their empire. Mm. So this is like the second half of the 14th century. Mm. Less than 100 years since the Ottoman Empire has been started. Mm. And they go around and they tell people, hey, 
uh, I forget the exact number, like one out of every seven or whatever. We need a certain amount of young boys. Yeah. And we need to take them. Yeah. And almost, I think almost always, no, 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 I think. They, they would have to be Christian. Cause, yeah. Because in Islam, you're not really allowed to, you can't really enslave other Muslims. Yeah. But you can enslave non Muslims. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, make it that way you want, but. <laughs> But so, and then they would turn these little boys into people that would work for the empire, yeah. and not just soldiers. The the really capable soldiers would go off into the janissaries, mm. and the janissaries, I, I hope you know from your Age of Empires experience, would be like the most capable. The elite soldiers. Turkish force. Yeah. yeah, but forget about Turks. They're like the elite elite force. Like yeah, yeah. you couldn't think of too many other forces um, soldiers. From the 15th to the 16th century who could compete with them yeah they were really like really advanced for their time yeah but not all of them would necessarily do that like if your temperament is not made to be in the army then mm. what can i do force you to be in the army you're just going to be a bad soldier so they would train people to be like a soldier um, bureaucrats and administrators mm. and uh, and other things as well engineers mm. you know other things they're very very intelligent um good way to use your like population yeah. 100% and one of the things I really want to talk about this actually this is very interesting because you see Turkic empires yeah mm. think about how many Turkic empires there are you got the Timurids the Ghaznavids oh. we don't know if the Ghurids were Turks whatever the Seljuks I can't really, uh, can you call them Mongols? Yeah, the, the Mughals, Mughals maybe you can call them that as well. Mm. They don't really last a crazy long time. Mm. You know what I mean? At, at least not for the, the length, uh, for the, the golden age of their, their history. Yeah. And I understand there's a lot of things that go into that. It's not just your own failures and weaknesses. Mm. Hi there, I'm Osman. How's everything going? Very good. Osman? Oh, we spoke on the phone yesterday. Tarek. Tarek, yeah. Nice to meet you, man. How's things? Everything is great, man. The food is amazing. Really yeah, more rice. Service is really good. <laughs> He's really good, yeah. He told us about certain things that we yeah. didn't even know about. Right. So, and then something really interesting happens right at the end, beginning of the 15th century, mm. where this once in a, forget lifetime, once in a millennia type dude appears out of nowhere mm. in Anatolia and uh, decides to have a massive showdown with the Ottoman Sultan. Yeah. yeah, so we're talking about Timur, Tamerlane, and as, they, as he's known in Europe. Mm. He has a big battle in 1402 at the Battle of Ankara. So that's one of the most epic, I think it's probably the most epic battle of all time, the Battle of Ankara. How big was it? Like you mean the, the size of the armies? Yeah. It wasn't crazy. I mean, if you look at the primary sources they're all going to say a hundred thousand minimum but yeah. we know that that's not necessarily true it was probably around 20 to thirty thousand. Oh. you know what i mean each um but what the, the reason i think it was so epic is that it was two men at the height of their power mm. it wasn't like one was on their way down the other was on their way up there wasn't a mismatch oh. and uh, they fought and that doesn't really happen that much in history even in like boxing and MMA like today yeah, that's what I was kind of referring to earlier often a big empire will fall um, obviously because the other side is excellent and, yeah. uh, they have momentum but there's also the factor that they're just weak from years of decline and then yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't take as much as you'd think to just wipe it all away exactly and exactly that's the norm right that's the norm in history that's, that's yeah. the way that it happens but with this battle mm. what happened was Timur basically outsmarted uh, Bayezid mm. and Bayezid was a bad dude like obviously we don't need to talk about Timur his reputation I think you can put him up there with uh, Genghis and, uh, and Alexander the greatest conquerors of all time but Bayezid was a bad dude as well. He had just defeated the siege of Nicopolis, mm. a bunch of different crusaders. No, the crusade of Nicopolis, pardon me. Yeah. A bunch of different crusaders trying to take on him. And he was besieging Constantinople. You know how Constantinople was uh, taken by the Ottomans in 1453? Um, gunpowder. 
Yeah, uh, but it was taken in 1453, right? Mm. Yeah. A lot of people say that it could have been taken in 1403 if really? the Battle of Ankara had not happened. Because Bay, Bayezid wanted to do it. And, uh, you'd be hard pressed to think of what would have stopped him to get it. Mm. But in any case, so Timur wins this battle, totally outflanks him. He like, Bayezid is here, Timur is here. Bezid goes over there, Timur goes behind him over here, Bezid realizes, oh snap, he's all the way behind me, and he comes back, soldiers are it's in the height of summer as well, soldiers are super tired and thirsty and everything, he had cut the water supplies, I think he poisoned them as well, and uh, just kind of a rudimentary yeah. victory, and uh, he actually imprisoned Bezid as well, how crazy is that? Yeah. And I, I know, I know uh, that you've made a video on this as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's literally my favorite painting, visual art of all time. Well, he walks in the room and bears it on, yeah, just on a mattress like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's chained. That picture is like, that's life. Yeah. I want to like, you know, when I have the wherewithal, I want to get a picture of that like, humongous <laughs> painting of that just to, in my room. Mm. But uh, but Timur treated him as a guest almost, even though he did it. He was in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point because he was like treated well. There's some it. like historical accounts that try to make it out to be that he was treated bad and whatnot. But that's not true. There's a thing where kings back in the day in Europe and the Middle East, whatever, Asia, kings used to treat other kings good. Yeah, they're almost of their own class. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're against each other, but they're similar. And even when they're against each other, it's like this innate understanding that we, we have to do what we have to do. It's a survival of the fittest. I want to be number one, you want to be number one, and let's see what happens. Yeah. Again, not to kind of keep talking about MMA when I'm uh, boxing, but it's like, you see how like in MMA and boxing, prior to the fight they're talking real bad stuff about each no. other after the fight you would think that they're lost lo lost <laughs> long brothers hugging each other yeah. kissing each other so it's kind of similar to that but remarkably what happens is Bayezid gets in prison and the Ottoman princes his sons four of them start fighting amongst each other mm. and it's called the Ottoman Interregnum mm. where for about a decade it looks like the Ottoman Empire is over. Like literally, each son gets a little piece of the empire. Remarkably, they survive. But just to take a step back, do we know why Timur didn't just finish the job and take over the empire himself when he won the battle? Right, right. Why, why, why did he not just advance? <coughs> That's a good question. And the answer to that is that it's not it's not in his modus operandi to do that like even if you look at Timur's empire on on, 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 in a, on a map it doesn't look that huge mm. but if you look at the kind of areas that he conquered or he looted it's way bigger so and this is kind of it feeds into the whole it's slightly more of a Turkic way of doing things mm. and this is why the Ottomans are a little bit different because they would establish governance and settlement there mm. and their authority whereas Timur like went to Delhi uh, looted it sacked it in 1398 mm. but he didn't like take over Delhi Delhi wasn't no. his he just, he came just back. wanted the plunder but he wanted the plunder that was it so once he got rid of the uh, Ottomans he left Anatolia to his own allies because mm. Bayezid had actually united Anatolia mostly under the Ottomans mm. lost that all the Beyliks come back it takes like another 60, 70, 80 years before the Ottomans could like uh, take over Anatolia again but that's one of those remarkable stories in history where it looked like the Ottomans before they even reached their golden age before they even take over Constantinople at that moment in time you would have thought oh the Ottomans are over now you know what I mean so it's remarkable I think so like we were talking about the Ottoman uh, interregnum, remarkable. So they managed to bounce back and uh, 
by the middle of the 15th century, they're ready to strike against uh, Constantinople. Do you know the name of the ruler who took over? Uh, Met Met the Conqueror, or Met Met the, the Second? The Second, the yeah, second yeah, yeah. not the First. Yeah. The First was his granddad, I think. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Mehmed Fakir, the conqueror. Mm. And uh, at the tender age of like 20, he managed to take over Constantinople. Incredible. Amazing, amazing. Um, but you, I remember you asked me a cool question about Mehmed. Ah, uh, yeah. So, before. One, uh, one of the things <coughs> I've always wondered about Mehmed the second is why he chose to stylize himself right, right, right. as um, the new Rome or the new Roman emperor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which to me comes across as a bit odd. Because uh, from what I know, he motivated and inspired his troops uh, as as kind of an Islamic leader. He said, "I'm continuing the Prophet Muhammad's work." Uh, you know, the the Islamic Caliphate in its in its origins did want to take over Constantinople. So if we do it, we're ca carrying on their work. So on the one hand, he comes from that sort of angle, yeah. uh, the Islamic Crusade sort of angle. But then once he actually achieves his objective, he gives himself an epitaph that's from a non-Islamic civilization, Rome, right. which I find weird. I wonder why he does that. Why did, why did he do it? Right, right, right. And to be honest with you, like the reason why I asked Ibrahim to like remind me of this question oh. is because I had never thought about that before. Yeah. And it's a really cool question. But more than anything, I think it's to do with the glory. Yeah. Right? Because if you look at the Roman Empire, it doesn't matter if you're Muslim, you're Christian, you're Buddhist, you're Jewish, whatever you are. When you look at it, you do think of glory. It's the pinnacle. In some ways, you can even argue it's the pinnacle of like imperial ambition. Yeah. It's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, imperial project ever. Yeah. Oh, right? So, if there is a way in which you can inherit that, yeah. it's going to do nothing more than to buttress and support and raise your level up as well. And, you, and I see what you're saying with the whole... Um, religious component of it yeah. but I think you can do that on a quote unquote secular level yeah. where you can just because the Romans themselves they weren't Christians they were they were the original persecutors yeah. Christians. Constantine you know did his thing and he converted to Christianity and all of that but it's more to do with like uh, imperial ambition more than anything just to take up that mantle take up that mantle and Mehmet was really serious about it because he uh, he tried to invade Italy as well Oh, did you know? Yeah. Literally, the year before he died, because uh, he took over this little town, village, I don't know, mm. uh, in uh, Italy called Otranto. Yeah. The uh, Italians retook it because uh, Mehmed died. But people were like really worried that you know Mehmed was going to come in Europe, that Mehmed was going to come and just take over all of Europe. So what? Once he died, yeah. what happened to the Ottoman Empire? Was was he replaced by someone? as capable or even near his, his capabilities? Kind of, well, definitely not like him because yeah. he's like, you know, a once in a history type, you know. A great man. A great man, right? But his son was in, he was half decent as well. Yeah. Bayezid II. And yeah. uh, under his reign, there isn't a whole lot of expansion. Uh, there's a lot of consolidation going on. Right. But it's in the reign of Bayezid II's son, the grandson of Mehmed, yeah. Selim. The first who only lived for eight years, but he's the one, and this is really interesting. Mehmet Fatir, Selim's granddad, stylized yeah. himself as a successor to the Romans, right? Mm. And up until the reign of Selim, the, the Ottomans were, if anything, a European power. Really? Yeah, because yeah. if, if we talk about Selim, that's 1512 to 1520, yeah. they come about in 1299. Do a quick mental maths, that's what 200 and 13 years mm. the first 213 years of your history of a, of, a, of a now if you ask the Ottomans if you ask people about the Ottomans they're going to tell you oh it's a proper Muslim yeah Middle Eastern superpower Middle Eastern superpower yeah. first 213 years they didn't even enter the Middle East why, why is that? because their whole focus was towards the Balkans yeah and for a little bit Bayezid the first and uh, after you know, uh, after the Ottoman interregnum, where they start to get their things back together in yeah. Anatolia as well, a little bit. But you can argue that Anatolia was a part of Europe at that point, yeah, under the Byzantines and everything. So they never necessarily like their focus, their imperial focus was towards Europe, the Balkans. Like they they moved into the Balkans way before they even moved into like eastern Anatolia. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and it's only in the reign of Selim that they take over Syria. Uh, and Egypt. Yeah. So, 
kind of interesting, huh? Yeah, I would have always assumed that they would be Middle Eastern facing, and the only reason they engaged with Europe was because Europe didn't like them and wanted to push them further back, you know? I never realized they actually wanted to push into Europe. That, that's you know? why I find it so interesting, because I thought the exact same yeah. thing. But it's obviously not that, it's, it's, the, it's the opposite. You know what I mean? And the pull, actually, considering where we are right now, we're eating at a restaurant, the move into the Middle East would have had a great impact in the Ottoman culinary well, the cuisine yeah. the cuisine as well you know what I mean like if you like what I said about the meze uh, mixed meze at the beginning right if you go to a Syrian restaurant a Lebanese restaurant you kind of get similar ones yeah right? and I'm sure there must have been some influence from Eastern Europe on Ottoman cuisine and maybe vice versa there must be, well vice versa 100% yeah because yeah. when you go to Bosnia <laughs> and Albania they eat baklava you know what I mean yeah, uh, the uh, kebabs, or all these things. I am not a hundred percent sure about how much influence. I'm sure there must have been, but I'm not sure how much influence they had. Yeah, the Balkans had them. Uh, yeah, exactly. exactly, but they must have. They must have hundred percent. So, but it's it's really with Mehmed taking over uh, Constantinople that the Ottomans really enter their golden age, mm. and that's when like Constantinople becomes this this place which. Like, you know, idyllic, mm. you know, it looks like some sort of a utopia. And then you get Suleiman the Magnificent, like the uh, century later. So, like, with the Ottoman Empire, it's not, they had the Golden Age under Mehmed, but it obviously lasts a lot, lot longer. Yeah. It's one of the longest empires in history. Yeah, yeah. So, what, what made it that way? Well, how, how did the Ottomans, just broadly speaking, uh, sustain their success? That's a great question, because I actually wanted to talk about this, even if you didn't ask me this question. <laughs> um, they, they were really interested in doing that. Yeah. You know when you want to like achieve something in life? Forget yeah. about like history or whatever. You want to achieve it? You have to first be aware of it, cognizant of it. Mm. You know what I mean? And then try to do it. But if, if that thought... To work backwards almost. Exactly. If yeah. the thought isn't even in your head of let's uh, have sustained longevity, then it's going to be tough for you to even come up with a way to do that. But were, so like for example, were there empires that didn't do that? Were there any empires you can think of that kind of created themselves yeah. and then didn't really think about what came next. There must be many. I'm not, like, we don't have enough primary sources to have, to put me in a place where I can answer that conclusively, yeah. but I can use my intelligence, my common sense and everything to say that there are a bunch of them. And what's funny about them, don't take this the wrong way, or you Turks watching this, but they tended to be Turkic ones. Yeah. What Turkic ones? Like Tim Timur. Yeah. Timur had a great empire, humongous. As soon as he dies, the empire is like gone. Yeah. The 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 Ghurids, which you could argue they're not Turkic, whatever. They may be something else. But after Shabdin Ghuri, Muizuddin Ghuri dies within ten years, an empire stretching from the Caspian to the Bengal. Yeah. Gone. So in a way, the Ottomans. They, they must that. have been cognizant. They must. Have, they, they must have been. They must have and, known that that happened. And one of the ways that they did this was, and the reason the Turkic Empire specifically would break apart, and it's why the Mongols, because Mongols are like the cultural cousins of Turks yeah. in some ways, and uh, so this is why the Mongol Empire broke up as well. Is when the dad, you know, conquers and you know yeah. creates a, mar a vast realm, and then when he dies, he's supposed to divide his realm amongst his sons. You see what I'm saying? But there's there's not there's multiple successes, it's not just one. Not one, exactly. Not one. So, but what the Ottomans tried to do after a while is they they, they started this uh, system of uh, fratricide. Oh, you know you know what I mean, right? Yeah, yeah. Killing your so brothers, quite dark. Like. Quite dark. <laughs> so what it is is uh, Tariq and Ibrahim are brothers. Imagine they got another brother called Muhammad and another brother called Abdullah. All four of these brothers would fight the one left remaining would inherit everything and that was just accepted that was encouraged yeah, 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 yeah. kill your own brother or yeah what? man there's one um, I guess Kyle speaks Kyle right? speaks a lot and they, they did that all the way until the beginning of the 17th century wow what's interesting is when they started doing that 
you can make the argument that the Ottomans started declining. So now I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying. Wait, wait, sorry. When they started doing it, or when they stopped. No, when they stopped doing it. When they stopped. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm not that, saying you got to kill your brother. That's counterintuitive. But it's <laughs> I'm not saying you got to kill your brother to be successful, but I'm just saying those two things happened at a fairly similar time. Obviously, there's a bunch of other things yeah. that happened as well. But I would argue that there is a correlation between those two, because there's a there's a, there's a sultan Mehmed the third. Yeah. Is it Murad the fourth or Mehmed? No, no, no. It's Mehmed the third. He killed I think 19 of his brothers. Yeah. I guess if you're willing to do that, you're probably going to be more focused on ensuring you have actual power. You see that? You see that? That's that's literally my analysis for why I think that's part of the reason of yeah. why you have to decline. It's like because you really have to earn it. Like. You really have to earn it, and it gives you unless you're like an absolute psychopath. Yeah. If I kill Ibrahim, my brother Abdullah, and my brother uh, Muhammad, it's gonna have to force. It's gonna like force, ingrain a sense of appreciation of this is some serious stuff. Yeah. This is not about but me I having to, like I have to work to win this and to secure my exactly. My and this is not about me just <laughs> eating all the great foods that come with being a sultan, having as many women, having as many children. There's like there's work that goes. To yeah. being the sultan, it's not like a lottery where I kill my brothers and now I can just live and be fat and just whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? You've got to like focus on the task at hand. Yeah. So do you um, think it helped create in a weird way like internal unity, like consolidated power? I don't see how you came to that. What do you well, mean? I, basically, what I mean is, if it, 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 it creates, it's a system that maybe creates an undisputed ruler. Right. So if you have an undisputed ruler with almost absolute power in the kingdom, oh, okay. If they're okay. going to they're gonna fight outside, or if they're just going to maintain themselves, yeah. If you have one source of power. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. In a way, it's dark, but it's also strength. That's a good thing. In, again, I'm not 100 percent sure about this, but I think that is literally the rationale behind why they wanted to do this. Yeah. Is they wanted to have Central, you, uh, central authority being exercised by one source, as opposed to splitting them up like Genghis yeah. Khan did, four different uh, yeah, yeah. kaganats. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a it's a very smart way of doing things. But again, at the same time, if we're moving away from the Ottoman Golden Age and going towards the decline, there's other inherent problems. Which, funnily enough, this is a beautiful metaphor for life. I moonlight as a philosopher sometimes as well. Um, it's a beautiful metaphor for life because the thing that kind of got them to the eminent position they have like in my opinion if you ask me the greatest empires of all time there's two that three that automatically come to mind yeah. guess what they are Ottomans yeah uh, the Mongols no. and the, oh okay uh, Timur no what, no I'm talking about the whole package of an empire Timur is just good at conquering he didn't set up yeah, okay, any empire, okay so yeah definitely Ottomans and British Empire? No, but okay, four. Yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. the British as well. Um, four, yeah. British Empire, uh, Alexandrian Empire. Alexandrian. No, no, no. Uh, it's closer to home where you're from. Archimedes Empire. Definitely, and then the last one or least. We just spoke about it like before. The question that you had about Mehmed. The Romans. Of course. Yeah. So those four. So like the the Ottomans. If you ask me about like the great empires, the Ottomans are definitely going to come into yeah. my head. And one of the reasons that made them so great was things like the Dev Shirmeni system, yeah. was the Janissaries. But that was a big reason, not a small, cute, innocent one. A big reason yeah. for why they would go down as well. You know why? Why? Because the Janissaries, what they were supposed to be was. They were supposed to be like the most elite forces. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So they, obviously they had a bunch of rules around them as well. Like they had certain things like, I don't think they could have shaved off like their beards. Um, I don't think they could have had kids whilst they were in active service. Yeah. And uh, some other, other, other things. But once the empire got to a stage where it got so big that expansion actually started to get kind of difficult, the Janissary started to get kind of lazy. Yeah. Where rest on their laurels. Yeah. Rest on their laurels. Where they wouldn't necessarily like somebody could be a janissary and take advantage of their official position slash status as a janissary and take advantage of all the positives that come with that yeah. financial and everything, but not fight. Yeah. Like they would just get somebody else to stand in the way. So it goes back to the problem of having power but not appreciating. And like not appreciating what goes into keeping it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. What it means, exactly. Yeah. And but. 
this is really good because the gen one of the reasons that the Janissaries were so successful is that they were so dependent on the Sultan because the Janissaries were supposed to be like the elite bodyguards of the Sultan obviously they expanded and at some point they there was like 50,000 of them as well yeah. at one given time but what that what that what that tells you more than anything is that there's a symbiotic relationship between having a strong figure as a sultan in order to keep these savages let's call them savages <laughs> janissaries soldiers yeah. hungry and and focused on what their task is but if this dude the sultan gets kind of lazy gets kind of fat yeah. rests on his laurels focuses on the pleasures of life forgets about the seriousness of statecraft then these guys are going to fall by the wayside as well you see what i'm saying yeah, and it yeah, gets yeah. to a stage where you actually get a sultan being executed by janissary less than so when, when, when did that happen that's uh, osman the second he was kind of young but that's like 1622 i want to say yeah so why, why did they execute because they just didn't agree with it. There, would, there, there, there have been loads of examples of Janissaries uh, mutiny yeah. uh, because they want more pay. And uh, the Sultan would like kind of pay them, etc., etc. But to execute a Sultan, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it would, uh, it would literally be 200 years later, in 1826, in something called the auspicious or inauspicious incident, yeah. where the Sultan, for like decades, planned the downfall of the Janissaries. He started his own new corps called the Nizami Jadid, yeah. the new corps at Kors. Is it corps or Kors? I would say corps. I think corps, it's corps. Correct. Yeah, it's corps. But it's like French, so the P, the French is always like silent. Probably, yeah. Corps, let's call it. And uh, over like 15 years he planned this, and then boom! In one day, he executed 6,000 Janissaries. 6,000. Up to like 6,000. And he just got rid of all of them. Yeah. And he had to do this all in secret. Because obviously... But, but that's the thing, like, that just shows that um, without, like, a single authority figure with enough power, <laughs> you have to take ages and ages and yeah. ages to consolidate it. Whereas before, I bet that didn't happen. Like, you yeah. had loyalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you had swift... I know what you mean. You know what I mean? Like, but on the flip side of what Abraham was talking about, and I totally agree, and it's a great point what you're saying, mm but you know how like reality works one yeah. thing could you could look at it multiple ways yeah. on the flip side of it one of the things that the Ottomans did which was so great was that they were not just totally dependent on the one figure yeah. so in their golden age up until Suleiman the Magnificent I would basically say every single one of ruler every single one of the rulers that they had was just an epic great man yeah. where you could write like a 500 page biography of. but you can't say that that is what made them great. It, it was a big part of it, yeah. but the thing more so than anything, and this goes back to answering your question like 10, 15 minutes earlier of why they lasted for so long, is literally the boring stuff. It's the super boring stuff, the bureaucracy, the paperwork, the administration. Like there's so many countries around the Middle East right now who have kind of a, a negative perception, memory of the Ottomans. Yeah. And, I, and I get like, it. Like who? Like, uh, well, maybe not the Middle East so much, but in the Balkans, definitely. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Serbia and, uh, you know, places like... Yes. Greece, surely? Yeah, Greece, Greece as well. Was under, yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. Like Serbia, Greece, Bulgaria. Yeah. Uh, even some of like Middle Eastern countries. I've read uh, in 20th century history, like Syria at certain points and places like that. Um, Egypt was... Was also and Egypt as well. You could you could you yeah, could they put were them into that category. Time, yeah, time. You could put them into that category. But one of the great things that the Ottomans did, I mean, colonial colonialism isn't a great thing. I get it. But a lot of things, a lot of bad things, leave positive consequences, right? It's just, yeah, yeah. It's a harsh it's reality of life. It doesn't make colonialism okay. It doesn't make the bad thing that happens. Uh, it doesn't whitewash them or vindicate them. But it is what it is, right? Yeah. Reality is complex. But they left a whole bunch of infrastructure in a lot of those countries. A whole bunch of infrastructure to do with like administration. What, do so with... what does that mean? Like the way they organize like resources or taxes or like Literally. how they administer regions? What, what do you yeah, mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. So how they broke that down. So, uh, so it's not literally <laughs> just like the Sultan 
and every single citizen in the empire answers to him. Yeah. That's not efficient. So you would have to break that down into vilayats, like uh, provinces, and then within that sub-provinces, and then you would have governors that have sub-governors, yeah. and just different like uh, administrative bureaus, uh, and then you would specialize for economics, for religious matters, for this, for that, and yeah. it, the whole thing just gets more specialized and it just works better. Yeah. And then I'm not even talking about the more tangible things like roads, maybe even like well, I don't even know how much hospitals and stuff but like sewage systems you know like really boring stuff that you wouldn't think about when you're talking about empires but, no, but, but I know what you mean like if you're from this place it gets taken over by the Ottomans at first you're maybe a bit apprehensive you have like you've been conquered you're yeah. not sure what's going to happen but over time if the infrastructure around you the sewage the schools the hospitals yeah. starts to get better you will notice right 100 like that 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 would, would be a factor that contributes towards stability yeah yeah, yeah. you're not going to revolt if everything around you is kind of okay 100 and we're not even talking about commerce and trade yes yeah, yeah. you know what i mean so so there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of that thank you i can kind of see how they survive for so long yeah. Oh, and the, the thing that I wanted to talk to you about, this is what I was going to say was, even if you didn't ask me that question, this is why I said, yeah. if you didn't ask me that question, I'm still going to bring it up. There's a dude named Ibn Khaldun. Yeah. You heard of him? No, I can't recall. Supposed to be like the founding father of sociology. Some people were stretching that and trying to call him the founding father of economics as well. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. But the reason I'm bringing those up is just to kind of show you that. He's a great man. He's a great scholar as well. 14th century, actually met Timur. Sat face to face with him. Kind of interesting. Towards the end of both their lives. Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, but he had this uh, idea about the rise and fall of empires. And he said that there's three stages to the rise of an empire. There's the, the beginning stage where the, the group of people and a lot of the time they would come from like a very harsh terrain a desert, a mountain, a steppe area yeah. right? and they would be inculcated with that kind of ruggedness that requires you to survive in those tough terrains and they would be highly militarized they would come to the city take nomadic. over no, kind of yeah, semi-nomadic, whatever so we're talking about the Berbers, uh, Afghans, Turks uh, uh, Arabs, the, the the Bedouin Arabs, right? Yeah. Uh, all of those groups of people, and uh, so that's the first stage. Yeah. Second stage is you conquer like major city, major urban settlement, and uh, you become civilized, and that is the golden age yeah. because your father would have been the first generation of that would have grown up under the last generation of the tough nomadic yeah. you know what I mean rugged terrain people so he has that kind of an understanding like first generation immigrants when they come to the first world yeah it's, it's almost like you know your dad who was an immigrant has yeah. to fight to make start his own business yeah. he appreciates every pound he makes or every dollar his son not so much because he's been born into a life not, not so much but he still gives you that yeah he still gives you that through his stories maybe you lived in the mountains the desert the steppes for a little bit as well yeah. but you've been raised in the city so in some ways you're the best of both yeah and this is why you get the golden age in this little nexus point and then a generation two generations three generations goes past and your children your offspring kind of forget about the memory of what got them there the tough terrain yeah. so they forget about that they forget about the, the the hard work needed the 16 hour shifts the sleeping four hour four hours a night doing all nighters because of uh, emergencies and instead just focusing on beautiful food beautiful women right yeah. just all of the pleasures and luxuries that come with life um, and then the third one it's just like the decline. Yeah. That's the one where they completely, they're completely separated. Internal divisions. Like. Internal divisions. They, they, they don't know how to lead. Yeah. They, 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 they've completely forgotten about the mountains and the deserts that you came from. Yeah. Um, 
And the funny thing is that that cycle does seem to happen with every empire. Every empire. And the beautiful thing is that I feel like I'm going on a 10 minute run and I haven't even told you my point. Is the Ottomans studied Ibn Khaldun. Yeah. So they look, they were they, they specifically. They're very con uh, conscious of like the, the potential flaws. They can exactly. Yeah. They're very cognizant of this whole process and they studied people like Ibn Khaldun to kind of see, oh, okay, this happens. They must have looked into history. Oh, this kind of happened with the Romans. Yeah. Oh, the Persians as well. The Greeks, I don't know, all of this. We don't want this to happen. And that's why, you know, like, I mean, the golden age of the Ottomans, let's say it's around 120 years, yeah. 1453 to 1566-ish, whatever. But they don't go into a sharp decline. The Ottomans fall in 1923. Yeah. Up until the beginning of the 20th century, they, you can argue, the end of the 19th century, there are three continent uh, empire. Yeah. So from 1566 to the end of the 20th, uh, uh, 19th century, that's a slow decline, dude. Yeah. Real slow. So and the things and the things that made them, the things that made it a super slow decline, is those boring, non-attractive things that we're talking about: papers, infrastructure, bureaus, roads. If they're not conquests, they're not big ideas. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's everyday life stuff. Everyday life stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Do you know the name of that? Katma. Uh, okay, so we're just here with the desserts. I got a kunafe, which this is the first time I'm getting it. It's been highly recommended. What'd you get, Ryan? And I got a uh, Katma. It's like a pancake with uh, pistachio ice cream and chocolate sauce. I'm going to be honest with you, when it first came, I didn't want to give that to Ibrahim. <laughs> I wanted that myself. I may have made the better choice. <laughs> I've we'll never, even, I've we'll never even heard of that or seen it, but it looks amazing. First time. Oh, it's very good. Good, yeah? Very good. Right. So what's in your dessert? This is kanafe. It's supposed to be like some sort of vermicelli string um, pastry but the reason why I haven't had it before is because I was always turned off by the idea that it had cheese in it yeah that's, uh, that's what I was going to say as well but I'm not going to lie to you I can't can you taste the cheese very strongly? no because I, I found out that it's not cheese as we know it's like sweet cheese or okay. creamy cheese okay. like cheesecake but not really. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> what about yours? What is yours? So it's like a pastry sort of pancake. Yeah. And then it's got pistachios on top with some chocolate sauce. And um, I think this is vanilla ice cream. But yeah, it's very good. Dude, this is so good. Let's finish off the history. So then. So. I think we're up to um, 19th, 20th century. Yeah, somewhere around there. So, we're talking about in the... Somewhere towards the beginning of the... Not the beginning, but like in the middle of the 19th century. Yeah. The Ottomans embark on this program of modernization. Mm. In every way. Technological, political, social. And that leaves a huge legacy. Which is succeeded by... Ataturk. I'm sure you've heard of that dude, right? Definitely, yeah. So it's supposed He's a big name in Turkey. Yeah, yeah. When I went to Turkey, I don't know if it's like a law. I don't think it's a law. But everywhere I went, like a shop, hotels, hostels, they all had a picture of him. Mm. I don't think it's a law, but I think people just respect him a lot. Yeah, he's venerated. Yeah, exactly. Because he's supposed to be the one that, after World War One. Obviously, the Axis lost, right? Mm. So the Germans, the uh, Austro-Hungarians, and the Ottomans. And when the French and the British were... Oh, here's the cheese. It's interesting. Pretty sweet. When they were talking about uh, splitting up the Ottoman Empire, the country based in like Anatolia, which was supposed to be Turkey, was supposed to be tiny origi uh, originally. Really? Very small. Way smaller than it is now. Mm. Armenia was supposed to be way bigger than it is now. Greece was supposed to have certain parts of Anatolia, like Izmir and those kind of Australia. areas. Yeah. yeah. But the reason that didn't happen is because Ataturk led 
uh, something called the Turkish Wars of Independence. Mm. Long story short, he won it and he forged out this new country called Turkey. And uh, he kind of set it on a very different trajectory to the other countries in the region. Mm. In what way? Like, he embraced secularism, moved them more from the east to the west, in the sense that he forgot about the old uh, Persian Arabic uh, uh, letters alphabet and uh, embraced the Latin alphabet with the clothing. Just tried to thoroughly Europeanize Turkey. Mm. So today, is Turkish written in the Arabic script or the Latin script? The Latin script. Mm. And that's because of Latin Turk? Um, yeah. Because you got to remember, at the time, Ataturk's one of those guys where it's very divisive. Mm. You either love the guy or you hate the guy. Or you're like me, you love and hate the guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because what you got to remember with him is, and the reason why you got to love him is that he was like a real patriot. I'm not even Turkish, but if I was Turkish, I'd love to get for this reason. In the sense that he really loved his country. And he loved it in the so much that he wanted to strengthen it and at that time his ideas of what it meant to be strong was being more like the European yeah. which you could look at now and go oh he sold out yeah. he uh, yeah he sold out parts of his identity which I think is kind of a fair thing to say to be honest with you but you can only say that if you take into consideration the time period he lived in. yeah so it's almost like if he didn't do that, there would be severe material consequences. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Right. Exactly. Yeah, he, ha he didn't have to, but if he didn't... It's almost as if at that time he had to. Because yeah. at that time, you could probably count on one hand how many Muslim countries were independent. I could probably cut off two of your fingers on your hand mm. and you could still count how many yeah. independent Muslim countries there were. And all of them were colonized by Europeans. Yeah. You look at just GDP, wealth, trade, just every metric of material progress, the Europeans were achieving it. So why wouldn't you want to be like the Europeans? It's yeah. really easy now to look at it and go, oh, but he could have found another way. It's like at that time where you're fighting for your very existence, you're going to tell me, oh, there's another way? Well, show me the way. Why don't you show me the way? You know what I mean? How do you do that? Now, with Erdogan, with right. him being in the news so much, what would you say he's kind of trying to reverse or right, undo right. Um, some of what Atatürk achieved? That's a really interesting like, um, development. Yeah. Because it seems like Atatürk, no, Erdogan has gotten to the stage where he feels confident enough to be able to reassert those traditional elements of Turkish identity and there's some people watching this who are fans of Ataturk and do not like Erdogan and I'm not gonna like what I just said but like I'm just saying like a Turkish I'm not saying like a Turkish person is not supposed to wear suits or wear this but I'm just saying like the traditional attire the traditional culture the traditional uh, religion the traditional way of life of a Turk had been different to what Ataturk envisioned it to be. Yeah. Now, you can make loads of different philosophical arguments about uh, what does tradition mean, tradition can be in flux, tradition doesn't always have to stay stationary, etc, etc. I'm not talking about it like that. But Erdogan seems to be, in a uh, seems to be at a place in his head where he feels strong enough to be able to assert his own spin on things the way that Erdogan did uh, the, the way that Ataturk yeah. did I always confuse those two so much <laughs> two sides of the same coin in, in a weird way right so and I know people have very strong opinions about this in uh, in Turkey like do they like what Erdogan's doing mm. like I made that video about the Hagia Sophia uh, so many people disliked it <laughs> but um, and a lot of people liked it as well actually, yeah. enough, divisive so. divisive yeah but it's weird. What do you think about what Erdogan's doing? 
Um, I think he's just doing what his voters want him to do. Right. Make Turkey more Islamic as it originally was. Right. Because, right. you know, if we just take what you said about um, Ataturk, right. he achieved great, uh, great things, but he obviously uh, alienated a large proportion or some of the Turkish population. And those more Islamic parts of the Turkish population still survived. You know, they, they, they stayed uh, within Turkey and their sons and daughters and grandchildren um, are the ones who perhaps more strongly support Erdogan. Yeah. It's just like, um, it's a, like a demographic or democratic almost battle yeah. within Turkey to define its identity and what its outlook. And now it's swung from the kind of liberal secular Ataturk one more towards the conservative other one you know like it's kind of just swung the opposite way and it from my perspective just, you just if you just look at the history of turkey kind of seems almost inevitable almost like the what that it would try to become more middle eastern and conservative i have a kind of a controversial opinion about this yeah and the only reason i'm gonna say this it's because I have a feeling that 95% of the people watching this video are not going to get to this stage. You've probably logged out. So the people who are really watching at this stage, you're pro uh, you we know, appreciate your commitment. We appreciate your commitment. <laughs> so I'm going to let you into uh, the deepest embers of my psyche. It's not that like I believe this, but that there's a part of my brain that entertains this. Gotcha. One, one kind of group of what kind of personality that I've been interested in in history about and like in, in, even in the present time are people that 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 need to do something I don't even know how I'm gonna like phrase it but like basically what I'm trying to say is that there's a part of me that entertains and I'm not I don't even know where I get this from this is just like the inner history nerd in me hypothesizing that Ataturk his intentions were pure in what he did in the sense moving turkey away from its traditional cultural uh, traditional culture and moving it more towards the european side solely from a material perspective of gaining more power but i would have i would hope you know that at some point ataturk would have realized that this isn't like a permanent thing yeah. that this shift towards becoming more European isn't permanent mm. and that we're only going to do it so that we can appropriate the positive benefits that come with it and somewhere down the line is going to happen what's happening right now which is Erdogan is going to bring it back to its more to what it was before yeah. you see what I'm saying? Yeah. but he didn't think he was changing Turkey for us yeah, like he wasn't... He wasn't changing what Turkey is, like it's identity. Like the essence or the root or the identity of it. He had to do that because in order to kind of instill change, you need to do it in a very uh, comprehensive manner. Yeah. And it would be kind of weird to just go up and make a speech to people, hey, we need to change this and kind of keep this. That would make sense, but sometimes like with huge groups of people, yeah, it's more easy to be like dictatorial. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. But this is just me like... I don't, I don't even necessarily believe this, but it would be really cool if this was true. Yeah, but we can never truly know what um, Ashton thought. Right, right. Because he's a really weird character, because there's huge parts of his uh, life where Islam was a big part of his life. And, you know what I mean? Like he fought in Libya. Yeah. And when he fought in Libya, he like instrumentalized Islam. Uh, he was like a commander. Mm. And he would always like view that battle against the Italians in Libya yeah. as if it was like Muslims against yeah. the, the, the non-Muslims and even in Gallipoli mm. you know what I mean but was he religious and, and Islamic throughout his whole life no, no. there's like uh, we're pretty sure that he there's some people that actually say that he died of liver cirrhosis because he drank too much alcohol oh my god we knew he liked uh, alcohol what's that Turkish alcohol mm. made from like yogurt like fermented yogurt, they have it all over the Middle East, different versions. Are you sure there's alcohol in it? There's definitely alcohol. In it. <laughs> that, I think it's a high quantity. Uh, it's got like that brand, Ayan, or it's like Duke. 
Yeah, but it's not that. So no. you're saying there's a similar one, but without the holy <laughs> Yeah, dude, you know the Mongu? Dude, you know the Mongu? One of the Mongu uh, Khans, literally like, we don't know if he died, but like, the, 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 there's primary sources that said that his biggest struggle in life was alcohol. And the way that they would make alcohol with like fermented, uh, not goat milk, but fermented some sort of milk. I didn't know that you could make alcohol with milk. Are you serious, dude? Yeah, I thought it was just yeast and stuff. They didn't teach you that in school? I'm, I, I'm glad they did it, man. <laughs> like, why would they? <laughs> nah. nah, you can make some serious alcohol with that stuff, man. Huh? There's Turkish and Mongolian. Yeah. Yeah. There's a name, it's just on the tip of my tongue. Yassi? No, I forgot it. But yeah. Alright, man. I think uh, we covered all the history yeah. of Turkey. I don't know how much of this was like audible because I've had food in my mouth. I'm not even making eye contact. But I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as we enjoyed the meal. Yeah, conversation was good. Food was great. Food was tremendous. Yeah. This tea was really good as well. And I hope you guys can join us next time so that we can cover other foods and cuisines and have uh, great conversations as well. Until next time, peace. Bye. <laughs>